And welcome back to coverage here of the 2020 season grand finals. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe with Paulo Vitor, Domino Rosa. Paulo, it's nice to see you. How are you? Hey, good, good. How are you, Marshall? I'm great. I'm really happy to have you along in the booth with me as we open up the standard rounds. This round, we've got Seth Manfield versus Patrick Fernandez. And uh, really interesting, Seth Manfield kind of throwing a curveball at all of us by playing Demir Rogues as it really didn't end up being a popular choice for this tournament. But when you see somebody like Seth play it, you have to kind of really take note, right? Uh, Seth, you know, is known for picking good decks for tournaments, generally speaking. And when he goes off the radar a bit, he usually does so correctly. What do you make of uh, of his deck choice here on playing Rogues? Yeah, I mean, Seth's deck is very interesting because not only is it a unusual archetype, right? He's the only person playing Rogues, period. It's also very different from the other Rogues decks that you might have seen. But right, it's much more slanted towards the control side of the spectrum, whereas most people seem to build rogues in with a more aggressive manner, like they play Brazen Borward, they play Rankle, right? They mm -hmm. play Zara Sam. So it's really an aggressive deck that is built on rogues. And Seth's deck is a control deck with a moving team that happens to use rogues because they're the best enablers. Right? So it's a completely oh. different dynamic. You don't beat Seth's deck with removal spells like you would a normal rogue deck. Um, as for whether it's a good choice or a bad choice, well. Personally, I think his deck is good versus the ramp version of the deck, uh, of Four-Color, uh, and not so great versus the Adventure uh, version, which is the one that we've seen the most, right? Mm -hmm. Because it can just go under you, right? Something like an Adrow Innkeeper or like a Clover, it's very easy to resolve those, uh, and they're not that easy to remove. Like Especially the Clover, uh, as Cedric said, if it starts, if it gets to play, it's going to stay in play, right? He doesn't even have Brazen Borrower to, to bounce in at it and put counter it on the way back. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think I favor the adventure decks here, but I also thought Seth had no good matchups in Historic and his 3 0. Right? <laughs> so, but by his own admission, if you like, Seth uh, gave an interview and he said, Yeah, you know, I don't think my deck is very good versus Omnath and it's not very good versus the, the four color uh, Yasharin decks. And I think he beat three of his decks, right? Or, or at least two of those. <laughs> So you can never count him out, and the margins are very thin, right? It's not like he can never win. You know, oh, this is a bad matchup. Well, it's 45%, right? It's right. not 20%. Right. Yeah, we see uh, Vantress Gargoyle on the battlefield already for Seth, one of the key inclusions in the deck. You also will will see him um, leveraging a couple of cool cards. One is that he is playing Lurus of the Dream Den. You can see that over in the companion zone there. Um, which which is pretty cool. And then also, you know, he is putting up a, a lot of higher toughness creatures like four toughness and three toughness to hopefully try to get around cards like the cards you see in hand there for Patrick Fernandez. Bone Crusher Giant. Really, you know, Omnath, of course, is like the headliner for the tournament since so many people are playing decks kind of centered around Omnath. But Bone Crusher Giant is the one that has the highest number of inclusions in the tournament. And it's, you know, it's dominance. I, I, it, I think it's people don't view it that way. But it has really dominated standard since it's come in, and, and it continues to do so. Yeah, it's really a bit of a different thing, I think, because Omnath, if, if you have an Omnath, your deck is an Omnath deck. Right. right? Whereas if you have Bone Crusher Giant, your deck is a red deck. Right? It's just a good <laughs> card, but you can play it in an aggressive deck, like we see Emma Handy, Autumn Burchat, and, and Luis Salvador are playing that in an Adventurous uh, Gruel deck. Right? Mm -hmm. You could play it in a Grixis Control deck if you wanted. That's a, right. a regular deck that we see in standard. Right, and then you obviously you can play it in in these four color versions. You can play it in straight Timur Adventures. Greg Kowalski is playing that too, so it's more that it's just a very versatile, powerful card that you can put in many archetypes. Whereas Omnath, it kind of tends to be the center of whatever archetype it's for. Right. That's right. Omnath drawing a lot of attention, <laughs> whether on the battlefield or on social media, and you see why. Here's Omnath on the battlefield already for Patrick, staring down the two copies of Vantress Gargoyle. Here's Lofty Denial. The Gargoyle, of course, has Flying, which is going to turn on the Denial and send that Beanstalk Giant packing. Yeah, and a pretty key thing here for Seth, because this would be the second land for, for uh, Patrick, right? So they would trigger the Omnath. He would get four more mana to work with. And right now, he's only going to play one more spell, right? Right. Uh, it is not a bad one, right? But... But yeah, it will, his turn wasn't that good at this point, and this just gives Saf the time to start working on those Ventures Gargoyles while he's offering the trade. Wow, an attack here from Patrick. And, and I you see like Seth this. kind of sit up. He's like, what's going on here? Yeah, I quite like this because Patrick knows he doesn't need this Omnath, right? 
Uh, normally, you know, Dominath is going to gain you four life per turn because you're playing a land, uh, and that kind of offsets the damage from the Gargoyle, right? So you would rather not have that trade happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but Patrick doesn't have any lands left, and he knows he doesn't have any lands left, so he maybe just is afraid of dying three turns. He will draw more cards over the course of this this game, right? He has a second Innkeeper, and then he has two Bone Crusher Giants. Uh, but I, I believe he thinks he he just wants to stem the bleeding a little bit, both in, in terms of how many cards are getting milled and how much power Seth has in play. Yeah, for Seth, even if he anticipates another copy of Omnath coming down, he still wants to make that block. Seth is sitting on two copies of End of the Story, and as these Vantress Gargoyles work their way up towards the seven cards they need in, in the graveyard for Patrick, those end of the stories can absolutely take over in the late game. That's draw four cards. He has eight cards sitting in value in his hand that he can leverage for the late game. Yeah, and they really go very well with drowning the lock, right? Because when you are playing uh, a card that draws you a lot of cards, what you need is cheap answers to go alongside that, right? Yes. You don't want to spend your turn drawing four cards and draw four seven drops, right? You want cards like drowning the lock that are just so, so versatile and cheap. Right, so that this is I this is I believe the core of this deck, right? We we call mm -hmm. it the new rogues, but I think it really is a drown in the lock and into the story deck that mm. happens to have some rogues alongside it, right? They're not even in play yet, right? Right. We haven't even seen them. Right now, Seth is facing down a decision on whether to deploy a second Vantress Gargoyle, but leave the shields down or hold up Drown in the Lock. And he's decided to leave up Drown in the Lock and stick with just the one Vantress Gargoyle for now. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't know uh, uh, Patrick's hand, right? But there are a number of very threatening cards that can come down, like Nath number two, if we suspect that, that there's a second one, right? I think from Seth's perspective, that is actually quite likely because right. of that attack. It's a pretty unconventional attack. Uh, or, for example, uh, Escape to the Wilds, right? That is a card you really want to deal with if you can. So interesting now... Seth actually has Patrick Fernandez at seven cards in the graveyard, and he can start attacking with Vantress Gargoyle. Now, he also has the seven cards needed to turn on into the story. Now, the rogues will, will get turned on with eight cards in the yard, but seven for, for the cards from this set. So they're good to go. Yeah, yeah, they are. Everything is on. I mean, there will be an eighth card by, by, by the time any rogue happens, right? Either by yes. entering play or attack. Uh, and now it will be a question of whether how much that values that Ventress Gargoyle, right? Because we right. could see a drown luck here. I don't think we will. Uh, I, I think he's probably just gonna. Oh no, he will counter it. Okay. Yeah, I mean it is very valuable, right? You you get your your five four flyer that is killing your opponent, and they lose the the second part of one Crusher giant. Yeah, that's a big turn for Seth, and he must be convinced that Patrick didn't have a devastating follow up play and figures Patrick would have just played it last turn if he had, like you said, another Omnath in hand, which I agree with you. That would be the read I would have if I was Seth and I saw Omnath attack. I would think, oh, you probably just have another one. But it's not the case. Here comes Beanstalk Giant as a big 8-8, eight, eight, but still 10 power in the air here for Manfield. Yeah, you see that, that Heartless is, Act as well? Yeah, that is a lot of power. Uh, it is a bit awkward because Seth has to choose between playing the Into the Story or the Heartless Act, right? He cannot play both. He would really, right. really like to play both here. Uh, and even with the Heartless Act, he has a choice on what to kill, right? Because he mm -hmm. doesn't know what, what uh, Patrick has in hand, but he knows there is a Bone Crusher Giant already a, as an adventure, right? So that's a, at least one guaranteed card. Uh, so is he trying to close out this game before these extra cards can matter, and in which case he kills the, the bigger creature or even doesn't kill anything, just plays into the story, right? Mm -hmm. Or is he just trying to uh, win the card battle with the Into the Stories, uh, later on in the game, in which case he might even want to kill the 1-1, one, one, the innkeeper. All right, so two different approach here for Seth. And worth noting, if he does play the Heartless Act here, he can bring back the Lurus, right, the, the companion, and that is a pretty good card to have access to. Uh, okay, so he can still be mana efficient this turn, even if he does only play a two mana spell. He's going to take out the 8-8 Bainstock Giant and put Lurus into his hand past the turn. So a little bit of a window here, perhaps, for Fernandez. He's going to resolve a Bone Crusher Giant from Adventure Zone. That's going to get him another card in hand. And yeah, he found another copy of Bone Crusher. Yeah, I mean, but that is just going to basically cycle, right? I don't think he can cast it. Uh, right. He can't cast Storm. He has to cast the Giant here and hope to draw something. And True. this is his last turn, right? He he has one more turn. He'll be at three life, and then you have to deal with two Adventurous Gargoyles. 
which and yeah. potentially three because Seth can just go lure his Ventress Gargoyle here. I don't think he will because that will expose him to fail wishes into a sweeper, mm -hmm. right? And that would just basically be putting all his ass in, eggs in that basket. And mm -hmm. he already has enough that he can survive. Uh, you know, he can still win through one removal spell, right? Through one Bone Crusher Giant that gets copied because he has two two threats. So I think, yeah, he's not going to play the lures here. All right, well, he's going to go for into the story. And he even found another land here so that he can potentially leave up Mystical Dispute. And it looks like he's got a Thieves Guild Enforcer, though that doesn't seem to be a critical card at this juncture. He's going to pass a turn back. There's a land off the top of the library, but it is a Triome. Yeah, and Patrick Fernandez has a couple of good draws here, like Brazen Borrower or Giant Killer would both be quite good. Ooh, uh, there's Brazen Borrower right there. Okay, so yeah, that is going to uh, buy him some, some time, at least. He just has to be careful about that Thieves Guild Enforcer, right? If he attacks with everything, he is dead. Right, it's um, going to be a 3-2 with Flash. Yeah, so he, he cannot attack with everything. He has to leave back at least one blocker. And it's a tough thing to do because you know that these gargoyles are coming back next turn. Right. Right. They're, they're not going forever. You're just stalling the game a little bit. At which point, well, you, you know you're in a race, right? So maybe he just has to attack with everything here and we'll lose the game. But he, he knows his opponent has eight flesh creatures, uh, all of which can eat the innkeeper and for which will win the game on the on the following turn, right? So maybe the innkeeper will stay back and be able to chump block here. It does look like that's what he's doing, at least thus far. It's still a three-turn clock with just the two bone crushers. Yeah, and I mean, Seth still, Seth is going to play the, the Thieves Guild Enforcer here, and he has into the story, so he's going to draw five cards next turn to try to find a removal spell and win the game. Okay, right? so that's the game plan from Seth's perspective. Well, it can be. It doesn't have to be because he's still mm -hmm. not dead next turn, as you mentioned. Like, he can just deploy more things uh, in, in the battlefield, right? Uh, th right? That is something that he can do. Okay, well, here comes uh, the Thieves' Guild Enforcer. Yeah, so it's basically his choice. Do I want to cast this into the story and try to win immediately, but, you know, put myself in a slightly worse position if I don't hit? Or do I just want to play a bunch of things and then put myself in a great position to win next turn, right? It's it's the choice he has to make here. Fernandez is considering deploying the uh, Brazen Borrower on the upkeep here for Manfield. Yeah, I think that is probably what he should do. Uh, it is the best versus Mystical Dispute, right? Uh, because, well, your opponent might not have the Mystical Dispute, but draw it on their draw step, right? You're not really dodging anything else. Uh, but now that that kind of backfired because he, I guess he could have played that on his turn and and found the fail of wishes to cast immediately. But that is basically the only card he would have cast, and he might be better off as a granted anyway if he doesn't die right this turn. Right. Wow. A lot of cards available here for Manfield. He can draw four, or he can even saloon division to look at six cards to try to find a removal spell for that Edgewell Innkeeper. Yeah, but now Method is in a, in a tougher spot because if he does play the Saloon Division or the Into the Story, uh, say he plays Saloon Division and he finds a removal spell and he casts it, and Patrick Fernandez drew an answer, right? Maybe a Brazen Borrower or um, another Bunkrusher Giant. Yeah. That is Steph's entire turn that is committed right. to the time. So, so I like this, but he, he's still in a good spot, right? He doesn't know what his opponent drew. So he's probably just going to play two features here. Yeah, just run out maybe the Vantress Gargoyles or maybe Luris plus a creature and give himself some blockers. I mean, Seth absolutely has the ability to pivot from the line of play that we were discussing before, where he kind of goes for the immediate win to a much longer, more drawn out game where he still has big advantages with another copy of End of the Story plus Luris in hand. Plus his hand is just stacked anyway. Like he, he doesn't need any, any more than he's already got. So... He certainly can change gears here and go for a longer game plan against an opponent on only one card. Now, the real yeah. question I have from here, Paulo, is how important is Granted going to be here? Are there things that Patrick can find to shore up this board state? Oh, I mean, certainly. I, I believe it is the best card he could have in this spot, probably. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. Uh, I mean, there, <laughs> there is a chance, like, depending on what happens here, I imagine Seth is blocking with Luras. 
So it's not going to die immediately, but for example, if Patrick attacks and Seth just takes the damage, the game's over, right? Because he can mm -hmm. flame, uh, yep. and then that will end the game. But I don't think that is the sequence we're going to see. Uh, but still, uh, for example, there is a Bone Crusher Giant in the graveyard, right? We can see uh, perhaps there's also a Brazen Borrower. So can we see maybe how much mana does he have? Oh, so he's just short. Like he can't play Granted and play get one cent future and then play one cent future and get uh, the Brazen Borrower and the and uh, the Stomp back, which would be lethal. Mm -hmm. Right, he's, he's one mana short from doing all that, and he does have to be careful with his green mana if that is his plan. So that can't be his plan, but he's, he, he tapped all his green mana, right? Mm -hmm. So he, he cannot be planning on casting once in future here. So he could cast a combination of removal spells. He could get you know a counter spell for later on. I think he just wants to go for it. He also has primal might, so yeah, he could he cast does. primal might plus red cat melee, for example. Right? Is that lethal? Does he have enough mana? Yeah, it seems like he does. So that is just that is just going to win him the game, right? If he goes Primal yes. Might on the Ventress Gargoyle and then Red Cat Melee on the Lurus, that, that should be lethal. And Seth has only a blue mana up, so I don't believe there's anything he can have. If he had a red, a black mana up, he could play a blocker, right? A surprise blocker with the, the Thieves Guild Enforcer. But this being the case, I believe Seth is just dead. Wow, and this is uh, slowly being revealed to Seth Manfield as he can do nothing but look on at the cards that Granted is getting out of the sideboard here for Fernandez. The first one, Primal Might. Yeah, and I mean, it, it is very tough from Seth's perspective because obviously Seth didn't know that the remaining card was Fae of Wishes, right? Oh yeah, this will do the job just as well. It's it's like Red Cat Melee, right? The game is gonna end here anyway, right? so it doesn't matter. You only have to be careful to deal with the gargoyle and then, uh, sorry, deal with the lures and then fight the gargoyle and not the other way around. Right, but you don't want that life game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it looks like Patrick Fernandez has found the victory here. Impressive fashion too. He was way behind. It really did look like Seth was going to be able to clean up this game, especially given, look at all the cards that he's got here. But Fernandez, with a couple of fortunate draws, is able to uh, leverage these to his advantage, going down to one here off of the trigger from the Bone Crusher. Yeah, you know, it, 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 sometimes you, we forget that this ability exists, right? I, I was. I forgot that, but he had exactly <laughs> the amount of life needed to get game one. Patrick Fernandez, very impressive victory on the narrowest of margins, picks up game number one at one life. And, you know, Paulo, it's funny. We had a chance to talk to Patrick, um, you know, before the tournament started. And one of the questions that we asked him was something that he learned about historic from the Mythic Invitational. And he said that Seth is unbeatable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he really seems to be unbeatable so far this season, at least. Yeah, it did. It does seem that way. But uh, now he, we're here in, in the fourth round and he's been paired against Seth Manfield and he's proven himself wrong. He's already beaten him once. He only has to do it one more time and he can take down the match. Now, Seth may take... Uh, take umbrage with this though he may say well unbeatable means the match so you know we'll we'll have to find out if uh if oh, Seth yeah. is actually beatable or not and Seth's sideboarding is as interesting as the rest of his deck right it's like oh one you know we play one skyclave shade and what is that for i, I don't really know you know these things there <laughs> might come in it's like oh do you want discard or counter spells why not both right uh right a little of both kinda, yeah it's it's an assortment I think. <laughs> so it's always going to be interesting to see how he sideboards. Uh, and whereas the other deck, obviously for, for Patrick, he he doesn't really have much of a sideboard because it's a wish board, right? So right. He, he does have three mystical disputes, all of which will come in. Uh, it is interesting because sometimes you leave one of those in the sideboard, right? Uh, for example, I found that in the Omnath Mirrors, when you are on the play, you actually have time to fail of wishes for dispute uh, before your opponent gets Omnath, depending on how you, your game starts, like if you have a Beanstalk Giant, for example, then you can use that to counter Omnath. So it's still useful to have one in your sideboard. But if you're on the draw, then you never have time to do that, so they might as well just all be in the main deck. Right? Uh -huh. And here, obviously, he's playing versus a different deck, uh, so I think he would want to bring those in anyway, but he's also on the draw. 
So it's extremely it's, reactive opener here for Seth Manfield. Three counter spells yeah. and a removal spell. Yeah, I can kind of see what you were saying <laughs> about this not really playing like or really resembling the rogues deck um, that, that we've seen more popularly played in standard. Yeah, well, that was a, that was a curveball for me. That the island on turn one over the the triumph. I guess I'm too used to these decks that really just want eight lands and play at all times, right? Right. Right. Uh, it, we haven't had a deck that would want to cycle a triumph from its opening hand in a long time. Right. So I always uh, just play them. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, you know, I, I would want my tenth land anyway, so I might as well just play that. Right. Uh, you could end up hurting him. Right, for example, imagine a scenario where next turn, uh, Patrick Fernandez just go land Lucky Clover, right? He can't oh. often denial that, and he can't miss to go dispute because he doesn't have a turn land. So yeah. it's a, a kind of a greedy play from him, especially because he might just end up playing it anyway. But this is not a deck that has as many mana sinks as the ramp decks were used to, right? So it makes right. sense to protect yourself from that flooding uh, and keep that card in, in your hand. All right, well, here comes an end step stomp. It's going to knock Seth Manfield down to 18 life. And we'll see if, uh, oh, Patrick actually has the one-two punch here. He's got the edge wall innkeeper to lead into the giant. And he's yeah, already I'm... putting Seth Manfield to a decision. Yeah, and this is one of the matchups where I think uh, the the innkeeper is quite good. Right? Because in this deck, if you're used to team or adventures, uh, you, you believe that this card is good all the time, right? It is one of the pillars of the deck. And in that deck, it actually is. Uh, but in this deck, it's a different thing. In this deck, it's more of a plan C, right? You, you have plan A and plan B, which are Omnath and Lucky Clover, depending on how your draw turns out. And then uh, uh, the Innkeeper is a distant third, right? Because a lot of matchups are not about getting that two for one or getting that extra card. They're just about getting on the battlefield and overwhelming your opponent, right? But this, where the success deck is constructed full of one for ones, counter spells, uh, and not that much pressure, then, well, getting that creature into play is very, very relevant. Really nice draw here. Soaring Thought Thief for Seth Manfield lets him just simply pass a turn back to Fernandez and play a much more reactive style with the Thieves Guild Enforcer on the battlefield. The Soaring Thought Thief, in combination with it, adds a lot of cards to the opponent's graveyard. And Seth can just take a hit here from Bone Crusher Giant and fall down to 14 and feel not too bad about it. And he has Heartless Act and Soaring Thought Thief. The Thought Thief also turns on the Lofty Denials to be, at least at this stage of the game, pretty close to a hard counter. So not too bad for Seth. No, I mean, that was like Seth drew, you know, instead of doing one card, he drew four. He drew Tidings, right? Because yeah. that turned the two Lofty Denials in his hand that weren't really cards at this point into cards. Right, they 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 became mm -hmm. they went from force spikes into counter spells, uh, and it also turns on the thief's guild enforcer, which was just a one one, and now it will rapidly become um, a three two, two, two right, mm -hmm. and uh, potentially a four two if the the sworn thief stays in play. Uh, so he really maximized his his whole hand at this point, and he was in a pretty precarious position before. I think right. he because. He, you know, this is a kind of deck where you have Mystical Dispute, you have Lofty Denial. If you don't have Into the Story going, you, you can't prolong the game that much, right? Because at some point, right. your opponent is going to draw and play more lands, and they're going to go over your counter spells. But now that Seth has a flyer, it is no longer possible. All right, so let's see what Patrick wants to do for this turn. It looks like it's going to be granted, which almost certainly will be met with some form of counter spell here from Seth. Yeah, and I think here uh, Patrick is playing around Lofty Denial, right? He doesn't know that Seth has a flyer, so he he doesn't know that that the ability to counter it anyway exists. Yeah, this is and kind of a blowout. To... Yeah, it, it is. So yeah, he chose to Ooh. play the, the the cheaper card. There's a Thieves Guild Enforcer number two as well. I bet you this one entering the battlefield will turn on the original. Yeah, and it doesn't I... need it anyway. Just the trigger from Soaring Thought Thief is enough. So. There's six damage thanks to the the, um, the Enforcer getting its bump plus the Thought Thief getting it active and now giving plus one plus zero to all the rogues. And all of a sudden, Seth Manfield has a board worth protecting. And this is playing out more like how the traditional rogues deck is built. Yes, this is more of the aggro control type of thing as opposed to the control control mm -hmm. that Seth's deck sometimes plays. Uh, and we know here Patrick has the Giant Killer, which will be able to get rid of the, the Thief's Guild Enforcer. 
uh, since it does have four power currently. But Seth has the lofty denial, right? He he can yeah. stop that. So so yeah, I mean Seth is gonna counter whatever Patrick plays and attack for ten. On the right. back, so we'll put Patrick in a pretty precarious position. I wonder if he should have played spells before attacking here because there's definitely a universe in which he doesn't want to make that attack. Right, for sure. Right, if he just goes giant killer and that is countered, then maybe he doesn't want to attack at all. He is still ahead on life and he doesn't know Seth happens to have another thief field enforcer, right? So mm -hmm. it is a tricky decision to make, but... Well, when he sees the way that this thing goes by the end of the turn, he's going to definitely wish he didn't attack there, although this is a lot of information that he didn't have when he made that decision. And of course, Paul is pointing out that he could have gained some of this information, not all of it, but some of it. As it stands, Thieves Guild Enforcer number two hits the battlefield. That means that it's going to trigger and the original is going to trigger as well. So four cards into the graveyard of uh, Patrick yeah. Fernandez. And I kind of think he should have just used the giant killer there. Uh, because if that resolves, then you actually get to play the giant killer, right? And get that mm. one to play. It, it, that one too takes a turn to get going. Right, for the tap ability. So I think you want to get that into play sooner rather than later, if possible. It does play around something like, you know, Seth might tap out to cast into this story, and then you play the giant killer. But it's possible that you would just, Seth wouldn't even want to deal with that if he had the into the story anyway, right? Yeah. So I feel like you're just giving Seth more of a choice there uh, because your, your play is not as threatening. It's just giant killer, uh, just chop, chop down instead of chop down plus giant killer, which he could have done. Right, he's kind of limiting himself there. Now it did get countered, of course. Unfortunately, Lucky Clover off the top for Fernandez looks way too late and he's gonna have to just move all in on escape to the wilds. Seth has multiple answers. He's got the negate in hand for it though, this turn. And that means that game number two is going to Seth Manfield, who was able to set out a very clean game plan again, uh, more reminiscent of the traditional Rose deck than the build that he's brought, but he was able to bring that sort of tempo, uh, you know, get a, get a board state worth protecting, protect it, and, and ride it to victory type game plan here. Yeah, and I think this is a deck, the way Seth constructed it, that is really, really much better on the play than it is on the draw, right? Because a right. card like Lofty Denial and even Negate, like versus this deck, you can use it to snipe Lucky Clover, right? Lucky Clover is the most important card, uh, and even Drowning the Lock sometimes can counter Lucky Clover if you start with the Thief's Guild Enforcer, mm -hmm. right? But on the draw, Seth has no answers. Like, it's impossible for him to deal with a Lucky Clover from Patrick Fernandez. If that card is in his opening hand, it will necessarily resolve and stay there the entire game, right? Seth has no way of balancing, no way of dealing in, in any capacity. Uh, and that is an incredible card against, against his deck. Right? It just gives you so much advantage. So the dynamic of the matchup changes a little bit when, when Seth is on the draw uh, for, for the worst for him. Yeah, you can see the answers he has here. And again, on the play, a negate or an agonizing remorse would be a fine answer to a turn to Lucky Clover. But on the draw, it just doesn't get the job done. And it really is some sometimes somehow one of the best possible cards for Patrick to try to mulligan into. I mean, this feels almost like a, you know, like when you bring in like a silver bullet uh, sideboard yes. card Rasting against the right piece. deck. Yeah. And sometimes you'll you'll be a little more aggressive with your mulligans to try to find it. It almost feels like Patrick needs to do that to try to find Lucky Clover because it is excellent against Seth while being untouchable. And it looks like he's missed here. He did mulligan, but did not find a copy of Clover just yet. Maybe one off the top of the library here, though. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it is it is a trump the same way that, not the same way the resting piece is, but the, the train of thought mm -hmm. is similar. But also, I don't believe he needs it to win, right? When you're True. playing versus a deck like Dredge, or like, oh, if I don't have my lane or my resting piece, I'm not going to win. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think this is necessarily the case here. So he can't just be mugging, you know, down to five to, to try to find it. Right. Uh, oh, wow, right. he chose not to play the innkeeper there. So a pretty conservative uh, line of play from, from Patrick, I think. Obviously, he doesn't want to expose it to just a removal spell the very next turn without getting some value from it, right? Right. Uh, I have found that in most matchups, you really just want to get that card into play, right? Because again, this is not plan A for the deck, this is not plan B, this is plan C. Uh, and then you play it and your opponent has to react to it, uh, or you're just going to get advantage for the game, right? Uh, but then they spend their turn reacting to it and you don't really need it. So you're fine when that exchange happens uh, at any point. But mm -hmm. this is not 
your regular matchup, right? This is a, a one for one control matchup that we don't get to see very often. That has no pressure in play. So I understand the decision to just hold that and basically guarantee a card. Funny how this, <laughs> you know, in game one, Seth played a very controlling game with the Vantress Gargoyles and kind of crafted around into the story, ended up losing to Patrick Fernandez. Game two, it played like traditional rogues. And now we're in game three and it looks like a control deck. Again, there isn't a rogue or an, a, even a creature in sight here for Seth Manfield. He's going to use negate to get the, the virtual two for one. It's really not a two for one, but it kind of feels like it sometimes when you when you counter a stop. It's a three for one in this case. <laughs> Just to get a card for the innkeeper. And True. here, I, I think, honestly, uh, Patrick, heavily punished by his play. Uh, well, I guess not heavily punished because he got to play Omnath, right? And that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think he really, really uh, just wishes uh, he hadn't done that, maybe. Because he would just be able to play the Innkeeper and the 4-3. And he was really just much more interested in the 4-3, right? The Negate cannot counter the 4-3. Right. So... And you get the card back, yeah. But here, Seth, also not overly worried about the Omnath, right? Uh, he had the yeah. choice between, uh, you know, kicking the, the Blood Chief's Thirst and getting rid of the Omnath, but then exposing himself to anything that Patrick might have, um, and the choice, or the choice of playing Agonized Remorse and keeping the Gate up, which is what he went with. Oh boy, he's going to take Fae of Wishes here, but leave Escape to the Wilds in hand. Patrick doesn't have the mana to cast it at the moment, but a land off the top. Ooh, hello. Yeah, and here Patrick, he could just go for it, and that would kind of be disastrous for him because he just get negated, and then his creature would die the next turn, and he would do nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, but if he just plays Keeper instead, then you're like, well, what does Seth do at that point, right? Seth is in a spot where he cannot tap out, or uh, escape through wilds will resolve, and he knows that. So he right. has to keep his two mana up at every point, which means he can't even get rid of the Omnath the very next turn. Right, so that gives Patrick more time to draw into things. Jomnath is not as threatening because Seth knows his opponent's hand, mm -hmm. right? And so even if if Patrick does draw Fable Passage, it's like, well, it's not a big deal, right? Uh, you you have a lot of mana, but you're not resolving it. Right. But hey, but nice yeah, job, yeah. Patrick. Just plays out the Edgewell Innkeeper and says, "Go ahead." Oh, another agonizing remorse here for Manfield. Yeah, that's pretty good, I think, because it will free up his mana. Right, so he can play Agonizing Remorse here. Uh, I would probably play a land Should you first. play the land first or no? Is he fine oh. if Mystical Dispute gets fired off here? Well, he trades the negate for the Mystical Dispute, I think, in the spot. And just puts him on zero cards? Well, maybe he doesn't, and then he just plays Bust Two Stirs on the, on the Innkeeper, right? And, and he's fine with that. And then he, he can leave up negate, sure. Yeah, he can leave him to get for the for the escape in the wilds. So, yeah, I think this play is pretty reasonable. It also puts cards. You know, he's he keeps putting cards in in Fernandez's graveyard, right? And he's getting closer and closer to that into the story, costing last mana. Right. Good point. It's still at seven mana right now, but once that seventh card hits the graveyard for Fernandez, he'll get that cheaper four mana version, which is very very powerful. Um, adding up a decent amount of damage here. And as you can see, Seth has used up all of his removal, so he can't actually kill on that, at least at the moment. Yeah, here it would be, I would be really interested in seeing how many cards are in Patrick Fernandez's graveyard, because I think if it's six, then this is a pretty, uh, pretty brutal for him because it turns on into the story. It doesn't look like it, it is. It wasn't, no. Yeah. So now I mean, what? Is it Luris? Is it Castle Indy Vision? Well, I think the best play is probably just cast a vision and try to draw. Ooh, well, hello. that is that is the best card. <laughs> right? right, because uh, you can deal with a spell or deal with the Omnath. Right. Uh, and you can choose. Yeah, you can. So he can just pass the turn here, see what uh, Patrick's going to do. But that does expose him to, like, uh, Mystical Dispute, right? He knows there are three copies in Patrick's deck. Oh, so just go ahead, Chosen. All right, so top deck war here, but one player has an end of the story in hand and the other one doesn't. <laughs> yeah, and here is a spot where, you know, if Patrick hadn't made the play of casting Escape the Wilds the previous turn, he would deny this play now from Seth, right? Because Seth... Oh, I'm, I'm very... Okay, because Seth could have, uh, couldn't have done that with the negate. Hmm. Right? He, had to, he would have to keep the two mana up. 
But here, Patrick could have just played the Bone Crusher Giant, but didn't because of the lures, right? The lures is very in your face. So, so what, what is his, he, he's trying to leave Stomp available as an answer for Luris kind of thinking longer term? Yes, I'm okay. not sure he is. Yeah, makes sense. Luris is a big, big problem going down the line. Okay, there's a Beanstalk Giant off the top. These are fine draws here for Fernandez, a couple of adventure creatures to fuel the fire, but they're not great, right? I mean, he doesn't have a Clover. Nothing's really going on otherwise. Yeah, they are not, especially because Saf has reached the point where you can just hard cast those into the storage, right? Seven mana is not that much. Right, he actually has it now. Yeah, yeah. he could even have just played that the previous turn, right, rather than using the castle and and getting the lures back. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I don't think he has anything to bring back with the lures, though. So Funny. he's probably gonna, Yeah, he might just pass the turn here. If that is what he's going to do, I kind of wish he had done it the previous turn. Oh, interesting. Right, because he, he could have reversed the order of his plays and just had three more cards in hand at this point. Right. Right. So so now, uh, I mean, he's still in a fine position, right? Oh, there is the, the, the seventh card. Ah, that was number seven, wasn't it? So now down to four each for the end of the stories. You see the draw yeah. step was Edgewall Innkeeper but not quite enough mana to make that work. So this is actually huge because this end of the story could find an answer for the Beanstalk Giant while it's on the stack and he could have the mana to cast it, but it looks like he hasn't done so. So now there's a big 7-7 seven, seven Beanstalk Giant on the battlefield, but we're going to see Thieves, Thieves Guild Enforcer come down and with its triggered ability, it will be a 3-2 with Death Touch as well. You also yeah, see yeah. Heart, Heartless Act in hand there. Yeah, this is where Shaft turns the corner, right? He's suddenly going to yeah. add... You know, six power to, to, to the battlefield. Uh, and he already has the answer for the giant. And here has another into the story that he can just cast that turn. So that is, I think, in an overwhelming, uh, overwhelmingly good position. Even though Patrick is a 28, you know, it'll take a while for him to die. But Seth just has a bunch of answers here. He doesn't even have to deal with the giant because uh, the creature has death touch, right? So he wants yeah. to play now with three heartless acts, I imagine. <laughs> As well. <laughs> Yeah, he would prefer to use Arlazak, but I mean, he does have two of the Death Touch creatures anyway, so he really has his pick here on how he deals with the variant. And I think I think his best shot might just be Lucky Clover here, because Seth cannot counter it this turn, right? Mm -hmm. So you play Lucky Clover, uh, then you play the Bone Crusher Giant, and you get to kill the 4 2 regardless, but. Instead, he found Fey of Wishes. Now he's going to go for Stomp to try to take down this Thief Skilled Enforcer. And that's going to resolve because no great answer here. Here's Edgewall Innkeeper with four mana available still for Patrick. Yeah. But plenty of answers for that with the Heartless Act as well. We might see Loft in Denial here just because that uh, you know, eats a card from Patrick, basically, and his entire turn. Oh, right? interesting. If Seth Lab does resolve, then, well, Patrick played the Bone Crusher Giant, and Seth can Loft in Denial that, but that guarantees that Patrick will get a card. And Seth has so much going on that he just wants to limit the number of cards that Patrick has access to, I think. Yeah, that was really clever play there from, from Seth. Just burning a lofty denial, not something you normally would think to do, but it really did cost Patrick Fernandez not only the rest of his turn, but a card as well. Oh, yeah. and two lucky clovers <laughs> milled away there off of the Soaring Thought Thief attack. That's brutal, Paulo. Yeah, and Patrick is not happy about that. You can see mm -hmm. his face. He's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> and now we get to see Luris come down and get back a Thieves Guild Enforcer right away. Yeah, so and now the, the, the denial plus heartless act, right? So Seth still has a bunch of answers. And if the lures does die, there's Agony's Awakening to bring it back. So one of my favorite of the new double face cards, the, the Awakening is really, really strong in this deck. Works mm -hmm. very, very well with the Ventress Gargoyle, right? Because the Gargoyle heals you while it's milling the opponent. So it, it fuels the Awakening in future turns. Uh -huh. And it's also a big creature that... Uh, that you can get back for, for only, that costs only two in the late, later stages of the game, right? So really right. A, a combination there. 
All right, here's granted now for Patrick. Yeah, he might just have to get a sweeper here. I uh, think he's not dead, right? He will survive a turn for sure. Right. But Seth yeah, he needs a way. Right. Sorry? Seth countered half of it. Well, no, he, he countered it, but he had the mystical dispute to force it through. Mm, okay. So, yeah, so the granted is resolving, and I imagine he'll get a sweeper here. Like, I don't think he has any card that will just win the game. So he has to settle for resetting the game, which is not good because, you know, Seth has that castle locked when he has four cards in hand. So Seth is just in a better spot. But I don't think he has much of a choice there. And, of course, Seth does have the Awakening to reset everything, but he doesn't know that, right? That's right. Here's Mystical Dispute for Manfield. That won't be quite enough to counter the Storm's Wrath next turn. But as you mentioned, the rebuild will be quite trivial here for Seth. I mean, he'll be able to attack for four the next turn with that Thieves' Guild Enforcer and then reload his entire board with the Awakening as well. Yeah, he's just in a pretty good spot. I think Patrick has to, to draw more, more things than he has, right? Because the, the Mystical Dispute basically guarantees that even if Patrick does draw something, Cannot cast it the next turn as well. Right? Whatever it is that, that Patrick. Oh, now Ooh. the game. Over. Cancel that order. Drown in the lock off of the cycled triome, all but locks it up here for Seth Manfield in game number three. This one is Patrick Fernandez was never able to get it going. You know, he, he never got to have a clover on the battlefield for multiple turns. He did actually uh, get on that for a little bit, but wasn't able to capitalize on it. Storm's Wrath is attempting to stem the bleeding and Patrick says, does it, does it resolve? Does it, does it? Okay, yeah, you have the counter spell for that too. Ketria Triome was draw step there for Patrick and uh, he could use up the rest of his man to cycle it, but he's gonna be taking way too much damage here. Four, eight, 11, 13 damage are gonna be coming in, which is enough for lethal. So instead he's gonna have to cast one of these creatures, but looking at the heartless act in hand for Manfield, we can see that it's locked up at this point. Yeah, and this game was a good example of, like, obviously Omnath is a super strong card, right? But it doesn't win the game on its own. You need some follow-up. Mm -hmm. So this is a game which Seth couldn't deal with the Omnath for a while, actually. He took, I think, 12 damage from it. Mm -hmm. uh, but he did manage to deal with all the follow-up uh, until he could finally deal with the card. Right? So, so you, you think that they should have made Omnath a little more powerful? Is that... Yeah, I think so. If only you drew three cards, then you'd guarantee you'd have some action, you know? All right. So there is another for Seth Manfield. I mentioned that we asked Patrick what he learned from Mythic Invitational, and he said, Seth is unbeatable. Seth is still... It turns out, beatable. actually unbeatable. Unbeatable. <laughs> and we've got Seth Manfield with Day 9 right now. Continuing an undefeated streak and joining us now is Seth Manfield. Congrats again, Seth. Appreciate that. That was a really close series with a really narrow loss in game number one. Talk to me about what were some of the key moments for you in that matchup. Yeah, I mean, I don't love reliving that game because I think I probably punted game one. Um, I would I think you to... did. You know, I have to think about that. I, well, I wasn't thinking about he can fay for the... Primal might and have the other removal spell ah, right. until it's, it was too late. I think I could have, I could have managed that last turn basically better. That last turn sequence. <laughs> well, I mean, I want to ask about this deck in particular because I mean, results are still coming in as of the time of this interview. But you are one of the only people that won against an Omnath deck that wasn't an Omnath deck. Talk to me about this build because it's kind of weird from the or a little different from the usual Rogues deck that you'd see on the ladder. Yeah, um, basically, my teammate, uh, I was working with the Von Flock for this one, and like mm -hmm. we we wanted to have Demir Mill be a thing, like straight up Mill, yeah, but then yeah. Rogue was doing so well. And then we ended up kind of combining the different versions of different things that we had. We knew into yeah. the story one of the best cards um, for the deck. So we wanted to be able to play a controlling game and an, basically a very, we wanted to be able to play long games and feel like we were going to be okay. Mm -mm. Well, uh, standard is over 70% Omnath. And I'm wondering how you feel about your standard deck going up as you have five more rounds of standard in a row to play. I feel okay about it. Um, I mean, I, I won the first one. Patrick didn't have any of the escape creatures like the spiders. 
So right, I right. think I'll probably run into some of that stuff, but hopefully I'll be okay. Well, we wish you the best of luck and congrats on being one of the only two undefeated players so far. Cheers. And now, back to the casting team. <laughs> Thank you, Day9, and, and uh, welcome back. Always good stuff from him. And, of course, it's always good to hear from Seth Manfield. Interesting, testing with Yvonne Flock for this one. We are going to be taking a short commercial break right now. When we come back, though, we're going to have more standard action. And look how excited Seth is. He just ran right out of the room with glee. We'll be back with more right after this. My name is Luis Scott Vargas, I'm 37, and I'm from the USA. Hey, I'm Brad Nelson, I'm 34, and I'm from the United States. And as you saw, we're going to be watching Luis Scott Vargas versus Brad Nelson here. This is game number three between these two gentlemen. They actually had two blazing fast games to lead in just a couple of minutes each for the opening game. So we get to see the, the decider here, Paulo. These players yeah. are both on uh, a little different versions of Omnath decks. Very little difference, right? I think between mm -hmm. uh, this list, as tends to be between the, the decks, because they're very synergistic, right? So there's the Adventures package, and then there's the Omnath kind of package, and there's almost 30 lands. So that doesn't leave a lot of room to diverge. Right. And the sideboards mm -hmm. also don't have a lot of room because it's all a bunch of one offs, right? So right. almost everyone is playing a, a pretty similar list. As you can see, the opener here for Luis looks pretty strong with Lucky Clover into two different adventure creatures. Hard to beat yeah. that. Oh, from there. Oh, Just hello. Curveball. Very yeah. nice little sideboard tech there from Brad. Yeah, and it's a card that actually lets you get back from basically unwinnable spots, right? Because if you have your own Clover, you can even go two Clovers with it. So pretty good card in, in, in this matchup. Oh, wow. And here I, I want to highlight, since the decks are so similar, uh, what I think is probably the most contested slot in the deck, which is sideboard board, right? Because you really see every approach here. Uh, Patrick Fernandez didn't have a land at all, right? Uh, Luis mm -hmm. Carhart has a branch lock pathway. Brad Nelson has Kazul's Fury as his land, and there are people who have table pathways, right? So this is, mm -hmm. I think, the, the, the biggest Ooh. slot of divergency that you can have. Yeah. You see that top deck there from Louise? <laughs> oh yeah, not that. 
immediately draws another lucky clover. They don't call him luck skill victory for nothing. <laughs> now all of a sudden he can have a really explosive turn here where he goes for Beanstalk Giant, more, more aptly Fertile Footsteps times two, which will allow him to cast either of his other two adventure cards uh, when he sees fit. It could even be as early as this turn. Yeah, and I think more importantly, you will just let him cast actual Beanstalk Giant next turn, right? And that is a bit of an underappreciated part of the card. In this deck, you routinely cast the seven drop, and it's routinely very good, right? And it as you move away from Brazen Borrower, they don't have that many answers to it. Uh, Ooh, how about oh, math yeah. off the top of the library for Luis? Woo! When you yeah, run hot, that you is, run that, hot. That is definitely very good. It's like, well, I already have a play scripted this turn. I'm going to cast my 7-7. Seven, seven, but instead, I'll cast a 4-4 four, four and a 7-7. Seven, because seven, it just drew a free 4 So is he playing around Mystical Dispute here by playing out that Fabled Passage first? Yeah, he, he, it has to be the reason, right? Um, yeah. So he does miss out on the trigger. Right. Uh, like, you could just get gone off this turn, right? But at the same time, he, he is making the, the hedge play, right? Uh, he doesn't believe, he believes he's ahead and he, yes, he's going to have nothing. Right? So mm -hmm. he can afford to make a play like this, right? He, he doesn't need things to go perfectly. He can afford to play around certain things. Uh, I, I believe if if he was far, far behind in this game, he would have done the opposite, right? He would have just gone for it and tried to play his whole hand. But now there's no reason to do that. He can just do that this turn. Really important to note when players take different lines, because how tempting is that to just go on that, then play the land, get the mana, and then, like you said, you could just play everything. You could play the giant. And uh, instead, Luis, recognizing that getting on math and keeping on math on the battlefield was the most important thing. And now look at the turn that he gets this turn, even after Brad Nelson has resolved uh, Escape to the Wilds in his turn. And this is really the big window here for Brad because he's got all those cards escaped, Escape to the Wilds, and he needs to make a big comeback here. He's going to kick things off with really the best possible option. But this is one of those rare times when the car draw a card trigger is kind of annoying because it actually gives your opponent the chance to, uh, to kill your Omnath. But look at this. Luis is saying, you know what? I'll do one upstairs, two downstairs, double Lucky Clover doing big duty here for Luis Scott Vargas. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I think, yeah, you can just, uh, you know, it's one of the, you know, that is why Omnav draws a card, is the rumor. <laughs> that That's the downside? <laughs> the downside, yeah, because now you can actually kill it with the trigger in the stack, right? So uh, it's, it's nerfed by giving him the draw card ability. Uh, Lewis could have gone for the kill there, right? If he bounced Omnav instead, mm -hmm. uh, he could actually finish Brad off with the Bunker Giant, assuming Brad didn't have anything. But other reason why he do that, right, is in complete control of the game. Uh, wow. right here. This is yeah. incredible, Paulo. I mean, Luis has now drawn the, his fourth Levy, Lucky Clover. One of them's in the yard, but the other two are on the battlefield, and he can have three on the battlefield and use Bone Crusher Giant or any of those type of cards to get the job done here. He looks like he's just going to cast it, draw a card off of the Innkeeper, and now he can use Brazen Borrower to send the opposing Edgewall Innkeeper back into the hand here and clear the way for a big attack. Is it lethal? It is. Yeah, 10 plus 4. Clear, right? Wow. That yeah. was a real <laughs> slugfest between those two top level pros. Ultimately, though, Luis Scott Vargas picks up the win over Brad Nelson there in the first round of standard for them. That is going to be it for this round number four. Paulo, thank you so much for joining me in the booth. You did a great job as always, and it's always a pleasure to hang out with you. We thank are you. going to take, you're welcome, Lisa. we're going to take a short commercial break. When we come back, more standard here from the 2020 season finals, our grand finals, excuse me. We'll see you in just a little bit.